Well, good morning. Good morning, church family. It's great to see everybody here. I know there's a lot of people, and so if there's a free chair beside you, just snuggle in. Get close. Leave some extra seats on the end. I know there's some people out there who look like they're in the uncomfortable seats. But it's wonderful to be here and uh, wonderful to be able to open up God's Word together with you. Uh, We are still in our series in Mark, this series that we're calling The Lion and the Lamb. So you can open up to Mark chapter 9. Um, The big idea that's sort of unfolding here in Mark, the, uh, the idea that Mark is centering his gospel around is the unveiling of Christ the King and the advance of his kingdom. And so all that Mark has been teaching um, and showing us in his gospel, and he's been showing us that Jesus has been teaching about his power over sin and death, his power over the demonic realm and the darkness, and all of this sort of teaching and this power, this revelation of, of the authority of Christ culminates in the last chapter that we saw where Peter gives this confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that the people of God have been waiting all this time for. Then Jesus teaches that the Messiah's path to victory is through suffering and through death and through resurrection, indeed through the cross. And this leaves his disciples a little bit confused. So they've been hearing about Jesus' authority and his power, and they know the scriptures which talk about the ultimate victory of the Messiah and the obedience that he would have over the nations, and yet now they're being taught that the path to victory that the Messiah must walk is through suffering and death, and they're they're trying to reconcile these two realities, that the Old Testament scriptures prophesy that when the Messiah comes that he would have the obedience of the nations, that the nations of the earth would stream and, and worship him, and that he would bring peace on the earth. And yet, now he's teaching that the Messiah must die and suffer and be rejected. And they can't reconcile those two ideas. And so, today, I think what Jesus is about to address with his most intimate inner circle is how can they reconcile the messianic rule of the Christ with his substitutionary death that is necessary for us to reign and rule with him. So we're going to jump into Mark chapter 9, but before we do, let's just pray and prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we love your word, and we pray that we, you would speak to us this morning through it. I pray that as we come to your word, that we would be in submission to it, that whatever your word has for us as we properly understand it, that we would be the kinds of people who want to believe and obey it. I pray that you would help all of us. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would silence my lips from saying anything that's not true of you or true of your word, that it would be your word and your word only that goes forth this morning and may it not return void. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 9, and I'm going to read the first 13 verses. And as you can see, just in the context, as you look up your page, Jesus has just been uh, on the mountain with his disciples when Jesus makes this confession that he's the Christ. Then it says, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer. That's the context that we find ourselves in. So Mark chapter 9, verse 1, and he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. 
And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So that's the word of the Lord to us this morning, and uh, there's a lot going on here. The first thing that I want to look at is, is verse 1 itself, which seems to be sort of out of place, because you have this, this transition in, in verse 2, where it says, after six days, Jesus takes his uh, uh, Peter, James, and John up the mountain. So verse 1 seems to be sort of out of place. Does it go with what came before? Does it come afterwards? What's going on here? And, and the verse itself is a bit ominous, right? He, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you that some are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Well, that's an interesting phrase, especially since in the book of Mark, we've seen very clearly that Jesus has brought the kingdom, that the kingdom of God is here Right? Because when he was um, accused of, be, of um, uh, casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, he said, well, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. But if it's by the power of God that I cast out demons rather than Beelzebub or Satan, then you know that the kingdom has come. And so because we know that Jesus' power came from heaven, not from hell, that his power came from God and not from Satan, we know that the kingdom has come But Jesus says something different here. He says, until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So there's some sort of power. And what we said when we were talking through that, when Jesus begins to teach about the kingdom of God earlier in Mark, right? He compares it to a mustard seed. He compares it to leaven that has to work its way through the loaf. That what we said about the kingdom of God is that Jesus brought it, but he brought the kingdom in seed form. And that the kingdom of God, brought in seed form, had to grow and expand as all the messianic promises had said it would. And this is consistent with what it's called, right? Leaven that has to work through a loaf, a a tiny seed that becomes a giant plant that dwarfs all the other plants in the garden. Or you go back to Daniel chapter 2, the tiny stone that becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. So the kingdom of God starts small, comes in seed form, and grows to expand over the entirety of the world. But what Jesus is saying is he, here is that there is some sort of transition that they're going to see in terms of the kingdom of, uh, the kingdom of God having power infused into it, or the kingdom of God coming in power. And, and notice what he says here. So there's generally four views on this. What is he talking about here? Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come in power. There's kind of four views that various scholars and pastors adhere to. One of the things that Jesus could be talking about is the transfiguration, which comes right next. That there's some sort of revelation of the power of God that's going about to come, and we read it, that he was speaking of. The second view is that he's talking about Pentecost. Right? That the, the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples and that infused them with the power to advance the kingdom of God. The third view is that what's really being talked about here is 70 AD. And historically what happened at 70 AD was that Rome came and destroyed Jerusalem as Jesus predicted it would in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. And so what happened at that time is the, the priesthood is destroyed right? The sacrificial system is destroyed. Israel is destroyed, which allows for the kingdom of God, the the Christian movement, to be separated from the Jewish movement at the time, and a new new sort of thing began to happen there. The fourth view is that what this is talking about is actually the second coming of Jesus, that, that when he comes again, his second advent is what's in mind here. So if you just look at the text, though, the first and the fourth, um, uh, uh, tr- um, interpretations can't be right here because he says there's some standing here who will not taste death well if he's talking about the transfiguration it happens six days later so none of them have died and if he's talking about the second coming of jesus the second advent of jesus at the end of of human history then all of them would have died so he's saying some who are standing here have not, will not taste death until what I'm talking about takes place. That leaves us with either Pentecost or 70 AD. I tend to prefer the 70 AD um, uh, interpretation, but the point here is that Jesus is talking about some sort of infusion of power into the kingdom of God. 
Let's look at the text and see if we can make more sense of this. Okay, so the next thing that you should ask is why is it that Jesus only brings with him Peter, James, and John? Right? We, we might say, well, they, they seem to be his closest friends, they seem to be his inner circle, but why only bring these three? And sometimes commentators will say, well, because Jesus is equipping them, he's showing them a, a glory that will equip them for the suffering that they're about to endure. To, and if that's the case, if that's what is going on at the transfiguration, then wouldn't Jesus have wanted to equip all of his disciples, Right? And so why bring Peter, James, and John only? Well, it's interesting that he brings three witnesses to the transfiguration, which is what the law requires, right? That whenever something big happens that needs the testimony of others, Scripture says to bring two or three witnesses. So he brings three witnesses. One of the other questions that we should ask ourselves is why do Elijah and Moses show up? What's going on there? Well, I think what's going on there is that Elijah and Moses represent the prophets and the law. So oftentimes when you hear Jesus talking to his disciples or talking to the scribes and Pharisees, he talks about the law and the prophets, right? The, the testimony of both the law and the prophets. And Elijah and Moses sort of encompass or symbolize the law and the prophets. And isn't it interesting? So uh, we, we, we don't have time to go there because there's a lot for us to go through, but you can just jot in your notes there, Luke 9. In Luke 9, you get the same story. It also shows up in, in Matthew chapter 17. But in Luke 9, it's interesting what's said there. Is it actually says that Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus, and you get a glimpse of what it is that they're actually talking about. There are these moments in Scripture that, like, don't you wish you had the full picture sometimes? Right? Like the Bible study that Jesus does with the disciples on the road to Emmaus where he opens up the scripture and shows everything that points to him. Right? That would have been like, just record that for us. Right? Like, why don't we get eyes in that, that? That's what we get to enjoy for eternity. But here, wouldn't it be great for us to sort of eavesdrop on the conversation that Jesus has on the top of Mount Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah? Great conversation, right? But Luke gives us a little hint of what it is that they're talking about. It says that he's, they're talking about the exodus that he was about to endure in Jerusalem. So it's pointing back to the exodus, and it actually says that they are talking about what's going to take place in Jerusalem. Well, we know what takes place in Jerusalem. That's the, the death of Jesus. So isn't it interesting that Jesus is up there, and he's talking to Moses, who represents the law, who would understand what legal requirements there would have been for making sacrifices, and then talking to Elijah, who symbolizes the prophets, who prophesied that there would be one day a man who stands in place, and on him the Lord lays the chastisement, the iniquity of us all. So Jesus is there talking to Moses and Elijah about the substitutionary death that he was going to receive in Jerusalem, which is pretty cool. There's Another, like, and just a, these are just asking questions about the details, right? Look at verse 2. After six days, why is it important that it's six days? Remember, details matter. And I think there's a parallel passage. You can either go there with me or you can just listen to me as I read it. Exodus 24. In Exodus 24, we see Moses and the elders and when they meet with God and they see his glory. Exodus 24, I'm going to start in verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, notice Moses plus three companions, much like Jesus with his three companions. Moses, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, pavements of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I might give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. 
And the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So you get this parallel passage that anybody who understands their, their Old Testament, who has stored up the Old Testament in their hearts, as soon as they, they read this encounter where Jesus goes up on the mountain with his three companions, a cloud descends on him, and then the glory is revealed to them, and he's there, goes up on the sixth day. Would, would, this is the story that would come to their mind when Moses went up and he receives the law on Mount Sinai and the presence and the glory of God descended on Mount Sinai and God spoke to him out of the cloud. So just as Moses invites God's people up the mountain to see God's glory and with him he brings his three close companions, what's going on I think in the transfiguration is that we are invited up the mountain with the greater Moses and his three companions to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Another story that I think is meant to recall to our minds here is the actual baptism of Jesus. And notice on the Mount Transfiguration, all three members of the Trinity are present, much as they were at the baptism of Jesus. At the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, right? And then the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. On the mountain, the Holy Spirit descends as a cloud, and then from the cloud comes the voice of God the Father. Again, this is my son, listen to him. So the transfiguration, I think, shows us a couple things, and we'll work our way to a big idea. So the first point's this. The transfiguration shows us, number one, a temporary preview of the nature of the resurrection. A temporary preview of the nature of the resurrection. I think one of the hints that this is revealing to us something about resurrection is the similarities between this story and another story that Mark has already told us. You flip back and just to remind yourself, look at Mark 5. And what happens in Mark 5 is that Jesus, um, well, I'll just read it, starting in verse 35 of Mark 5. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? You remember, this is Jairus' daughter. Jairus comes and says, come to my house. Jesus gets delayed with the woman with the issue of blood who touches his garment, and power goes out from him to heal her. And then Jesus, now because Jesus got delayed, this happens, and and they they come and they say, your daughter's dead, why trouble the teacher any further? Verse 36, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except who? Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion. People were weeping and wailing out loud. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and, and went where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them to tell no one uh, that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. So I think Mark has already told us this story, and this is the last time that Jesus brings Peter, James, and John on their own little secret mission. It also happens to be the only, the only time previous to this where Peter is called Peter rather than Simon. And so I think Mark is intentionally drawing our attention to this story where, again, Jesus is with Peter, James, and John, brings them on a special mission, and then right after the resurrection, right after they bear witness to the resurrection of this girl, he says, don't tell anybody about this. And what does he say on, going down the mountain of transfiguration? Don't tell anyone about this. So I think we're supposed to be thinking about resurrection as soon as we come into this story. And I think it's important to us because Mark is making us think about the last time he brought G, uh, Peter, James, and John, and that story is about the resurrection of Talitha. I think many people mistake this instance of Jesus as revealing his divinity. When we think about what the transfiguration is, a lot of us think that it's sort of as if Jesus had a man suit on and he gets up on the Mount of Transfiguration, sort of pulls off his man mask and reveals his divinity, reveals his glory, reveals that he is truly God. 
But I think the problem with that is that the incarnation was not concealing Jesus' divinity, right? It was revealing the true and living God. Jesus later says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he doesn't say that to Peter, James, or John. He says that to Thomas. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus was not concealing the divinity. Jesus was actually revealing divinity. That's what the incarnation was, right? Emmanuel, God with us. The whole, the whole point of the incarnation is that it actually reveals divinity. The popular Christmas carol has it exactly backwards. The Godhead was not veiled in flesh, but it was manifested in the flesh. And that leads us to our next point. The future, so the transfiguration shows us the future glory of true humanity. So the transfiguration shows us a temporary preview of the nature of resurrection. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But it also shows us the future glory of true humanity. So what's going on on the mountain? It's not that Jesus is pulling off his, his man suit and revealing the divinity hidden underneath. What's actually going on here is that Jesus is actually revealing true humanity. The transfiguration is not about the revelation of deity, but rather the revelation of true humanity. God created human beings to reflect his glory. And you notice the, the um, story that we read in Exodus 24, when Moses sees the glory of God, what happens? Do you remember? His face shines, right? In fact, he, he had to come down off the mountain and actually put a veil over his face because the other Israelites couldn't even look at how his face was shining. And that's exactly how Jesus is described at the transfiguration, that he's shining, shining so much that even his clothes appear to be completely white, whiter than any uh, garment could be bleached. So Moses' face shines after he beheld the glory of the Lord in Exodus 24, as we read, and, uh, and the uh, shining of his face is in Exodus 33 and 34. Also think about Stephen, right? In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen gets stoned, it says his face shines like that of an angel when the heavens are opened uh, above the Sanhedrin and, and Stephen sees Jesus at the right hand of God. I think what that's showing us is that we were actually created to, to glow, to shine, and it's sin that's dimmed us. In fact, just speculation, I'm just going to throw this as a total aside, but sometimes it's fun to speculate with what we know of Scripture. We can't be dogmatic about it, but let's speculate for just a moment. Isn't it interesting that when Adam and Eve sin, that suddenly they recognize that they're naked? And, and of course, we understand that there's a moral or an ethical reality to that, that there was suddenly shame about their nakedness. But perhaps it was even more than that. Perhaps as they were created to reflect the glory of God, perhaps they shone in such a way like Moses when he saw God's glory, like Stephen when he saw God's glory, like Jesus as he's revealed at the Mount of Transfiguration. Perhaps just very pragmatically, the shining of the revelation or the reflection of the glory of God was dimmed by sin, and so then they recognized their nakedness. And that sort of seems to jive with Revelation 21, where it says in the New Jerusalem, there's no need for a son. Well, why is that? Because Jesus, the son, is there, and there is the glory of God, which replaces the son. But an interesting, an interesting sort of proof that this is about the, the revelation of true humanity as opposed to the revelation of deity um, exists in Peter's error. Notice that Peter suggests three tents, which are literally three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, suggesting equal honor for all three. Why would he suggest equal honor for all three when Jesus is his rabbi? He's already, he's already declared the Messiahship of Christ because they were all shining. They were all reflecting the glory of God. It's only the voice from the Father that points out the uniqueness of Jesus among the three. So what Jesus is doing is revealing to his inner circle why his suffering and death was necessary. Remember, the context is important here. So right after he teaches them that the Messiah's path to victory is through suffering, through death, right? Jesus is now revealing why his suffering and death are necessary. This glory that he's about to leave behind, this glory that he's experiencing on the mountain that he's about to leave behind, despite Peter's objection, by the way, because Peter says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's just set up tents and stay, right? That's Peter's reaction. But despite Peter's protestation, 
Jesus is going to leave this glory behind to go back down the mountain. And he'll take this glory back up again at the resurrection, which of course comes only after he is obedient to the cross. So let me wrap this into a big idea. Here's the big idea. The transfiguration reveals the power of resurrection life. The transfiguration reveals the power of resurrection life. So picture the scene. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and goes up a high mountain apart from the people where he is transfigured. And this word is actually really important, transfigured. The Greek word is a form verb of metamorpho, which is where we get the term metamorphosis. And when I say the term metamorphosis, most of you think of some sort of school time and thinking about the transition from a caterpillar to a butterfly, right? Isn't that what we all think about when we hear the word metamorphosis? But that's, where, that's what this word is, metamorphosis. And it, it, what it means is an undergoing of some sort of change of form. The term, the term morph literally means um, form. So it means to change form. And I want you to just think about this. If, if what's going on at the transfiguration, right, and, and, and all three Gospels use this term metamorphosis, if it's a transfiguration, if it's a changing of form, if it's a metamorphosis, then if all that's going on there is Jesus is revealing his deity, what has changed? Right? Because we don't believe that Jesus surrendered any of his divinity to put on flesh. The incarnation was an addition, not a subtraction. Right? So he, he did not empty himself of his godlike qualities. He remained God completely but he put on flesh. And so what would it be that metamorphed? What would it be that changed if all he was doing was revealing his true nature as God? Nothing would have changed, right? Unless we believe that he somehow surrendered some aspects of his divine nature in order to become flesh. So what was the cha transition? What was the change? What's going on? What's the metamorphosis? And I would say that what we're getting a glimpse of is the resurrection life, the resurrection body. What Jesus is showing his disciples is the glory that's awaiting all of us who are in Christ in the resurrection. He wasn't, he wasn't pulling his face back to show divinity. He was, he was revealing true humanity, humanity as it was meant to be, humanity in the absence of sin, humanity in the absence of death, humanity as it's meant to be for eternity, shining and reflecting the glory of God. As I said, we tend to think of Jesus as revealing his deity, but that's not at all metamorphosis. Words matter. The caterpillar to butterfly illustration is actually really fitting. And the reason it's really fitting is because of what Paul later teaches in 1 Corinthians 15 about resurrection. We don't have time to go through the whole text, but you can just jot down for your own study this week. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read a, a section from verse 35. This is Paul teaching later. He says, someone will ask, how are the dead raised and with what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And this is exactly what Jesus just was teaching, right? In, the, my path to victory is through what? Suffering and death. This is what Jesus is teaching. He's teaching about resurrection. With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what, uh, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a light, living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that, that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is a man from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are all those who are of the dust. And as is the man from heaven, so are all those who are of heaven. Just as we are born in the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven." I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit what is imperishable. For this perishable body must, 
put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall co- it shall come to pass the saying that was written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So what Paul comes along and teaches is, is exactly what Jesus is teaching on the Mount of Transfiguration. That there is a glory that is awaiting all of those who are in Christ Jesus, and that is resurrection life. And and Paul comes along and he says, and unless that body, which is like a kernel, dies, then what the spiritual cannot be raised. Now I want you to think about this, because this is actually super important, because so many of us, we think about resurrection life, we think about eternity as this sort of ethereal we're all floating on clouds, spreading, you know, Philly cream cheese over our bagels or whatever. That's not, that's not the reality. If you haven't seen that commercial, you'd have no idea what I'm talking about. But, but we have this sort of ethereal existence. And I, I've had this conversation with my kids where it's just like, is heaven going to be any good? Because all we picture is this sort of floating around on the clouds, this ethereal, disembodied reality. And, and to be human is to be a spirit and a body joined together. We are material and immaterial. That's what humanity is. And there's nothing wrong with us longing to be human. In fact, it's a Gnostic heresy to want to escape the sort of evil flesh and just be a spirit forever. And so those natural things that you think about, like, like am I actually going to enjoy eternity without steak and football and, and, and earth, right? Well, good news for you. Our eternity isn't an ethereal existence in the clouds. In fact, just because it's called a spiritual body doesn't mean that it's not solid. We see this because when Jesus comes back in that spiritual body, what does he do? He eats, praise God, right? We still get to enjoy good food, right? It's not just an analogy that we'll be at a wedding feast, right? So Jesus rummages around for food. He gets uh, food cooked for him by Peter on the beach, but he can also go through walls. And so we think, okay, it's ghostly, it's wispy. But some of you, if you've been around long enough, have heard me say there's two ways to get through a wall, right? One is that the wall is solid and you're a ghost, and so you can go through it. But the other way is that the wall is a ghost and you're solid. I think the resurrection eternity is more solid, more tangible, more real than this world. And so what Jesus is giving them a glimpse of is the resurrection reality of what eternity is going to look like in in resurrected spiritual bodies. It's physical, it's tangible, it's beautiful, it's glorious, it reflects the glory of God, and he was showing them this is the eternity that's awaiting you, but it goes through suffering, and I'm going to go through the cross. But it has to And Paul comes along and says it very well later on. It's like a kernel that has to be sown in the ground. And when it is resurrected, it was sown perishable, it resurrects imperishable. It was sown in dishonor, it's raised in honor. And so he's showing us the reality of resurrection life. It isn't just, uh, I I think this is a really important application too, because it's not just, wow, the resurrection is going to be really great. Right now, through the process of sanctification, we are becoming what we are destined to be. In fact, it's it's really cool, and I don't have time in the scope of this particular sermon to go into it, but but for your own studies, go, go to Romans 8 and study there this week. You know, creation, it says in Romans 8, is actually groaning. It's it's sighing. It's it's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's waiting for us to enter into resurrection life so that the rest of the cosmos, the rest of the world can be pulled into resurrection life with humanity because the destiny of the world is tied to the destiny of humanity and the destiny of humanity is tied to the last Adam. So a couple points of application as we go through this. I think it's really, really interesting that this word transfiguration is used several times throughout scripture but only a few. And so we're, we'll look at all of them, and this will, this will make up our application. So it's, it's talked about in the Gospels only in reference to Jesus showing us resurrection life. So only on the Mount of Transfiguration is this word used in the Gospels. In the epistles, it's used first in Romans chapter 12. So the first point of application is this. Be personally transfigured by increasing in knowledge. 
So the first place in the epistles that this is used is in Romans chapter 12, where it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed or be transfigured or be metamorphed. That's the word by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what that verse is saying, right, if the only time that we've ever seen this word in the gospel accounts is in reference to the transfiguration, which is show, Jesus is showing us the future, right, of humanity tied to the resurrection, then here you get the application of Paul, and he says, if you want to start that transformation process, to become what you're meant to be, to, 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 to follow in the way of Christ, to be transfigured. He says, to be metamorphed, you have to do so by the renewal of your mind. That is, there's something in the Christian life that is tied. You will not be metamorphed. You will not be transfigured. You will not be transformed into who God wants you to be. You will not be, we'll say it in really Christianese terms, molded and shaped into the man or woman of God that you're meant to be if your mind is not being renewed. What does that mean? Well, for some of you, the challenge here is that you have a very experiential faith, or you might have a, a, a very simple faith. Both those things are good. We're supposed to experience God in Scripture, and we're supposed to have a simple childlike faith. But there is an intellectual aspect to the faith that you cannot experience the fullness of your Christian faith if you aren't disciplined in interacting with your faith in an intellectual way. You're, renew, you're transformed by the renewal of your mind. And notice that the renewal of your mind, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, is contrasted with being conformed to this world. In other words, don't be discipled by the world, be discipled by the renewal of your mind. This means you allow the word of God, careful study of God's word, to become the driver of your mind. If you've ever been in to, to see me for any sort of pastoral counseling, this would be a familiar phrase to you where I say spiritual warfare is far less about exorcisms and casting out demons and talking about demons. Spiritual warfare is a battleground for what or who controls your thinking. Does the world and its ideologies control your thinking? Does trying to fit in at work or at school or with your peers does that control your thinking? Does your own insecurity control your thinking? Does your own self-confidence and ego control your thinking? Or does the word of God control your thinking? And those are very different things. So we are called to be personally transfigured, personally metamorphed by increasing in knowledge. There's an intellectual aspect to the faith that cannot be escaped. And so... I know some of you who say, I'm not much of a reader, I'm not much of a studier. God chose to reveal himself to us through the written word, which means Christians being disciplined in understanding the written word of God is important. And it's something that every Christian ought to cultivate. He still wires us all differently, but we are all, all, we are all called to renew our minds by increasing in knowledge of him and of his word. Second point of application is this. Be personally transfigured by increasing in faith. So be transformed by the renewal of your mind, right? Increase in knowledge and be transformed by increasing in faith. The second place in the epistles where the word metamorphosis or transfigured is used is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can go there if you'd like to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can just jot it down later. I'm going to start in verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, so it's a hint that we're on the right track, right? Where these same words are being used are also recalling to mind the different stories that we found that were in relationship to the transfiguration. So this is talking about when Moses went up the mountain, saw the glory of God, and came down, his face was shining. Verse 8. Um, sorry, which is being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. 
Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will that which is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now get this, this is the important part. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, are being transfigured, are being metamorphed. How? Into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is Spirit. So what's that talking about? It's talking about beholding the glory of the Lord and being transformed from one degree of glory into the, to the other. In other words, the glory that was revealed in the transfiguration, the glory of, of future glorified humanity in the first glorified human being, Jesus Christ, it says we are being transformed into that bit by bit. How? As we re- behold the glory of the Lord. So the, the principle there, the big idea there, is that you become like what you behold. You become like what you behold. This is why um, Isaiah is clear, the Psalms are clear, that those who worship idols become like their idols, right? The analogy that uh, Isaiah uses is their, their idols are deaf, dumb, and mute, and those who worship them become deaf, dumb, and mute. So the idea here is that whatever it is that you behold, and that word behold, it's not just about seeing, Right? It's not just about being around. It's not, it's not sort of this osmosis by whatever it is that you're around you become like. But it, it's not less than that, but it is more than that. This word behold actually talks about what is it that you're pursuing? What is it that you're gazing at? So simple question for all of us. What is it that you're gazing at? What has your gaze in the world around you? Is it the next promotion? Is it the next thing? Is it a perfect house, a perfect family? What is it that you're gazing at? What you gaze at? What has your gaze? What has your attention? We are created as worshiping beings. We are made to worship God, and as we worship God, to become like God. But if other things hold our gaze, if other things hold our attention, if other things are what our narrow focus is on, we become like those things. And so is it any wonder that the world seems to be collectively going mad together? No, it's because they're all looking at the same stuff. As Christians, we are meant to behold the glory of the Lord. How is it that we do that? We're around people and we do things that have us focus our attention on Jesus. Are the people that you spend the most amount of time with having, shifting your gaze to other things? Or are the people that you're spending time with shifting your gaze to Jesus, helping you see Jesus. I'll tell you, a series like this, and, and I've been so blessed by all of our time and our study in the book of Mark, because we're seeing things of Jesus that you don't see if you're not beholding him, right? You see that, that he's not just the substitutionary sacrifice, that he's this king of the whole world who demands allegiance. You see that in, in, these, in these moments where the Pharisees are, are confronting him, that Jesus is just as confrontational, just as assertive. Sometimes we miss those things if we're not taking the time to behold him. And so what is it that has your attention? What is it that you are beholding? A couple of verses to kind of tack on to that. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 5. For it was, not in, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, when you, when you read that, just a moment... When you read that, you ought to ask the same question that the author of Hebrews anticipates his readers having. Right? It says, you've crowned him, Jesus, with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection to him under his feet. You, 
so the, the, the objection there is, hold on a sec. As I look at the wicked world around me, I do not see everything in subjection to Jesus, right? right? You don't see everything under, underneath his feet. The author of Hebrews anticipates that, and he says, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, get this, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we do see him, for who a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. What's what's the point in that? What he's saying is that as we look around, we might not see the world as it's supposed to be. But what we're called to do is see Christ, who will one day have everything underneath his feet in victory. And so it says we might not see that yet, but we do see him, and he gives us the faith to see what we can't see with our eyes that we see with faith. And so I would just say the same thing for you. You might be sitting to it and listening to a sermon like this and saying, man, Nate's telling me I got to be intellectual, I got to study, I got to have more knowledge, I got to have all this stuff. And you might be getting sort of like, I, I, I can't be that guy, I can't be that girl. You know how busy I am, you don't know this, you don't know that. Well, you are called to take steps of faith and to see with your mind's eye a vision of yourself as that person who is being reformed, who is being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Transformation starts with faith, which is why Jesus showed Peter, James, and John the glory that awaited them because they were all going to have to walk through the same suffering. They were all going to have to see in their mind's eye what they didn't yet see with faith. And so wherever you are in your journey, maybe you're not the dad that you want to be, maybe you're not the wife that you want to be, maybe you're not the, the Christian that you want to be, first thing you're called to do is see Jesus and then by faith, see in your mind's eye who Jesus can transform you into. And then you spend your time trying to become that. Last thing I'd say, last point of application is this. Don't stay on the mountain. Go get to work and pay the cost. Peter's second error in this whole exchange on the Mount of Transfiguration was his desire to stay. Lord, he says, it's good that we're here. Let me go get a tent for you and Elijah and Moses. And that's the temptation for all of us. We ought to love church. We ought to love being in God's word. We ought to love our quiet times of prayer and study. But that's not the goal. If Jesus created us for that time of fellowship, he would have whisked us away to heaven when we received new hearts. But he left us here, and our transformation is for a purpose. We are transformed that we might be transformational to the world around us. Jesus knew his glory was leaving behind. Um, sorry, Jesus knew this glory that he was leaving behind would not return until he accomplished his work on the cross. And he was teaching Peter what Paul would later describe as the eternal weight of glory, which is far greater than and not worth comparing to his current suffering and affliction. John 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves this life loses it, and whoever hates this life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And notice that the very next thing that Jesus says in John chapter 12 is that when he is lifted up, in other words, when he dies on the cross, he will draw all men to himself. That's John 12, 32. And then that he did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That's John 12, 47. So the idea here is that we are meant to experience God, behold God. We are meant to study God. We are meant to grow in godliness. But the goal of our lives is not to spend our time beholding that glory. The goal of our lives is that that beholding the glory would cause us to be a transformational blessing to the sphere in which God placed us. So we go up onto the mountaintop. We gather every Sunday. We go to small group. We spend our time in the Bibles. But that turns us into the kinds of people that bring the light into the darkness around us. And then, slowly but surely, by the grace of God, the preaching of the gospel, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we see all things, slowly but surely, being put under his feet in subjection to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We love your word. And we desire to be people of your word. Lord, as we think about this amazing moment 
when Peter, James, and John got to see the glory of Jesus, what he looks like and what he is like right now at the right hand of the Father in his glorified human reality. I pray, Lord, that just as it empowered them to then be people who transform the world around them, I pray that, too, seeing it would transform us. May we be committed to becoming people who are transformed by the renewing of our mind and disciplined study and by beholding your glory by keeping our eyes and our gaze on you as we walk through this world. And as we do so, Lord, I pray that you would knit us together as the kinds of people who can be a transformational blessing to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.